be reading 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10 from the English Standard Version. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. And I just pray for Charlotte as she comes. Lord, bless her with the gift of discernment, with an articulate tongue that she may speak and that you bless it so we may hear your word for us today. Amen. Charlotte? Hello, I'm Charlotte and I work with the Bible department with Youth with a Mission, so mainly with the online department, but also I teach at the King's Lodge, in the, which is in the Midlands, and also in various places around the world. So Bueller asked me if I'd preach, so I'm here. So it's lovely to be here. Thank you for asking me. So I want to talk about names, and some people give, some, chil some parents give their children names just because they like the name, and some people give their names because they like the meaning of the name, and some parents give their names because they're passed through the generations, so every generation they have the same name. So my name is called Charlotte, I'm, it's from the French, Charles and it actually means free woman. So I am a free woman. Uh, you might know that Nicholas, do you know what Nicholas means? Yeah? <laughs> yeah. And, and Grace, I wonder why Grace was called that name. Was it because her uh, family believed that she would grow into a woman of grace? Or was it a family name? I don't know. Or it might have been that, that they believed that it was a time of grace for her to be born, that the whole community and the family were feeling the grace of God because of her birth. And so it was a community name. Who would call their child distressed or doomed or you are not loved? Imagine that. You probably know Jesus is um, from Joshua, Joshua or Joshua, meaning to save or to rescue. And he is our savior. And in Isaiah, He's called Emmanuel, God with us. And he is indeed with us. And when Jesus met Simon, he said to him, his disciple, he said to him, you are Peter, which means rock in Greek. And Peter might not have been a rock at that time, but he grew into his name and he became a rock for Jesus and died for him, and he was steadfast and strong. So this verse that's just been read, it comes from the prophet Hosea in the Old Testament. Do you know Hosea? Yeah. And his, his name is derived from Jesus, Hosea. Um, it means to save. So when the early Christians looked at the, Old at the Old Testament, they could see Jesus living through that. They saw Jesus. And so they often refer back to the Old Testament in their New Testament letters. And we've seen that with Peter. And this is what he's doing. He's taking this verse from Hosea. Verse 
and he lived in the 8th century BC. Hosea, it was a time when the Israelites, there were now two kingdoms, Judah in the south and Israel in the north. There were 10 tribes in Israel and two in Judah. And Israel was a covenant people. They were dearly loved by God. And he was a husband to them. He described himself as a husband and Israel was his wife. And as his wife, he desired to, for them constantly to be in this covenant relationship with him. But so often, they didn't behave like the wife that they were meant to be. And they would go after other gods. And they followed the worship patterns of the nations. And this included sexual immorality, worshipping these idols which were made of stone or wood and which the nations worshipped. They worshipped pagan gods. They were involved in magic and they had no hope. But their hope in worshipping these pagan gods was that they thought they would be prosperous. But they weren't. They worshipped them because they thought that they would obtain the favor of these pagan gods, but they didn't. And the, the name Israel actually means wrestle with God. And Israel did wrestle with God. So it was a time in the, in the 8th century BC where there was peace and prosperity. They were going through a good period in Israel. And yet their behavior was falling more and more into moral decay, more and more into sexual immorality as they worshipped these, these foreign gods and part of that was sexual immorality. And there was one God in particular that they worshipped, and his name was Baal. And that name means Lord or husband or master. And so they were behaving as though they were a husband to this God called Baal. And it came that they couldn't even distinguish the difference between Yahweh a God of love and compassion and mercy, and Baal, who just demanded worship and was nothing. And their love affair with this Canaanite God was because they wanted prosperity. But actually, what it brought was injustice and an imbalance of wealth and poverty. And Hosea was this last prophet that God sent to the Israelite people to lead the people back to the covenant, which is what prophets did, back to their love affair with Yahweh, their true husband, and back to know the precious people and chosen people that they are, they were, and they could have been. So, if you know Hosea's life, you know that it was a very disturbing life. God asks him to marry a prostitute, to show the feelings that Yahweh the husband has for his people. And so Yahweh, uh, he, Homer goes and she mar he marries a prostitute and she's called Gomer. And she bears a son, and he's called Jezreel, which means God plants. And so this is probably Hosea's son. But then she goes off after the idols, and she goes off after other men, and she behaves in a, a sexually immoral way, and she bears another child. And it's from another man. 
and her name is called Lo Rohama, which is Hebrew for no mercy or not loved. And it says in Hosea, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel that I should in any way pardon them. And then she is accepted back by Hosea in the same way that God, Yahweh, is always accepting back his people. But she goes off again and she has another adulterous affair. And then she comes back and she bears uh, another child, a son called Lo Ami, which means not my people. And it says in Hosea, for you are not my people and I will not be yours. So Goma represented adulterous Israel and the children's names represented Yahweh's rejection of the nation and God's judgment on them for her sins. Once they were not a people, once they had not received mercy. So through Hosea, God prophesied that Israel were no longer the people of God. They were no longer loved by God. They were no longer under God's protection. He no longer had mercy on them. And because of this, he was forsaking them. He loved them, but he had rejected them because they just went after idols. Yahweh is holy, and he doesn't share his wife with idols. So this is a very visual picture of how God felt and the great love and compassion he had towards his wife, constantly going after her. But she was constantly going after other nations and other gods. And so lovingly, he forsook her. And Hosea's actions should have sent alarm bells to Israel. They should have been really disturbed by this, by what he was saying. And they should have, and they could have come back to their God, but they didn't. And so God could have changed uh, what happened, but because of their actions, he didn't. And so God forsook, forsook the Israelites. They no longer had his protection over them. And the Assyrian Empire, which was the mighty empire of that time, they came, they put hooks in their noses, and they dragged them off into exile. And this happened in 722 BC. And what happened was Israel was no more. Those 10 tribes disappeared. But Yahweh promised through Hosea that the very ones had been rejected would eventually be restored. He says in Hosea, Lo Ami would be called Ami, my people, and Ben El, sons of God, and Lo Ruhama, renamed Ruhama, loved. And speaking through Hosea in chapter one, he says, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of of the living God. And in chapter 2, verse 23, God said, I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. And I will say to those called, not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. It's challenging. And you are my God, we in the church say, as the loved people of God. God has shown his love and mercy through his son, prophet, and king, Jesus Christ. And we are the bride of Christ. Paul used this same quote in Romans 
chapter 9, verse 25 to 27. And he used this quote to refer to the Gentiles when he spoke, uh, when he wrote the letter to the Romans. And it seems that Peter has probably borrowed this from Paul, because this letter, which is being written to mostly Gentiles, but some Jews, now in, in what's Turkey, the dispersed people. But what is profound about what Peter and, and Paul is saying is that once Israel was do judicially declared not my people by God, they were not his people. They were then indistinguishable from the people that they were really meant to be because they were not under God's protection. They were not God's people. They dispersed into the nations and they were conquered by the Assyrians. So they were lost. They were damned. It made no difference that they were under a covenant because it was only God's grace. It was only God's gracious love that actually saved them. It wasn't their ethnicity. It was his grace and love. And in Peter's time, they were under the Roman Empire. And this was ruled by Rome. And the capital was Rome. And there was an allegiance to the Roman emperor. They were meant to bow down and worship the Roman emperor to prove their allegiance. There was also worship of the Greek gods. And this, again, led to sexual immorality and prostitution and protection and favor was sought from these Greek gods. Business was done in the temples as well. And few wanted to go the other way in case these Greek gods would be cross with them. These Greek gods didn't promise forgiveness of sins or immortality or freedom. They were manipulative. So the Gentiles were not God's people. The people who worshipped idols and Caesar and lived in sexual immorality were not God's people. But now they had come to know the living God in Jesus Christ. They had come to know their Savior. And so they became God's people, like a new Israel. So these scattered strangers in the Roman Empire in Turkey had once lived in a world without mercy and without love because they did not know the mercy and love of God. And they were not a people of God. But they became God's people. They became God's treasured possession, chosen and valued. And they entered into this covenant, this new covenant. And these early believers too, the same way that the Israelites were meant to be a light to the nations and they were meant to be distinct and different, so too these early believers were meant to be a light to the nations and to be distinct and different. As ancient Israel was called out and chosen, so now they were called out and chosen. And in these last times, we the church, we're called, we're chosen, we're loved by God, we're the bride of Christ. They couldn't have it both ways in those days, and we still can't have it both ways. They were either God's people or they weren't. They either understood the way they were accepted and chosen, or they didn't. 
but they're not able to live by the Spirit of God and worship idols because holiness and idolatry doesn't mix. And it's the same today. And Peter has been urging these early believers to understand who they are and to understand their identity in Christ. And it comes through knowing who they are in Christ and knowing what he has done for them and living for him alone. For I desire mercy, which is the same as steadfast love, not sacrifice. And that's what Jesus said. He said it to the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. And the Hebrew word for mercy or steadfast love is hesed. And it means faithfulness. And it especially denotes a, a loving, a loving um, kindness and dedication to the covenant. And it's a, it's a word that can't really be translated because it comes from the heart. And God has never looked for religion. He has always looked for this deep relationship. And it expresses itself in truth faithfulness to him. So when Israel sinned, it wasn't just a broken commandment or a sin against the commandment. It was actually breaking a relationship with their husband. And for us too, nothing has changed and God is timeless and true. And who his character is and who we are in him hasn't changed. Before we became Christians, we were not God's people. We lived as a people unloved by God because we didn't know him. We didn't know his mercy. It is only through understanding the crucifixion and the resurrection that we understand the mercy of Christ and his great love and his great mercy that he has for us. Jesus was brutally crucified, but he defeated death and he rose again. And that brought full forgiveness for our sins and life eternally with him. And by the Holy Spirit, we live by him. And it could only occur because of the shedding of blood because of what had happened at the beginning with Adam and Eve giving their life to Satan. And as the church, we are the bride of Christ. As Yahweh was a husband to Israel, so Jesus is our husband. And our life is centered on him. Our identity is in Christ. We are God's special possession. We are privileged. We are sanctified. We are chosen. We are loved. We are distinct and different. And that's not to have pride or superiority, but it's to give praise to God and to honor him because his love is unending. And our identity and our purpose are completely God-centered. We may be Jewish or Gentile or black or white or English or African or Swiss or a plumber or a doctor or a scientist. We may be single or married and we, or we may classify ourselves as gay or transgender but if we see our ethnicity or our color or our sexual orientation as our identity and we live out of this, it will come into conflict with our identity as Christians. We are the bride of Christ. That is our identity. We are all justly condemned and estranged from God. God. 
because of our rebellion and sin, but we have been bought at a price. Through the cross, we have received mercy and love, and we are chosen through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And everything that we enjoy as God's chosen possession, God's royal priesthood, God's holy ethnicity has been guaranteed because of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. The Holy Spirit, who comforts us and convicts us, he dwells in us because of the cross. The forgiveness that reconciles us to God is secured because of the cross. It's Christ's crucifixion on the cross that has made us his people. And it's the cross that has poured out the mercy and love of God and made us the forgiven people that we are. We're still living in this alien world filled with idolatry, but we have a choice. We are deeply loved by God, and we need to know this. We are God's living body. His living spirit lives and breathes within us. And our understanding of God and what Jesus has done for us is immensely important because it, it, it dictates how we live for him. Do we live by the Spirit of God because we understand our identity? Or do we live after our flesh and go after the things of the world? Our identity is in Christ, and we need to live by him and for him. And corporately as a church, we know we are forgiven. We know we are loved. We know we are restored into a relationship with God because we are told this and we can read it in the word. But do we believe this? It's a two-way relationship. As Peter had a relationship with, his, with Jesus, so we have a relationship and our center needs to be in Christ. We need to be in a relationship by the Holy Spirit. And he wants us to know our identity, always being centered in him. And it's a sanctifying process, a continuing process. So when the Holy Spirit came down on Jesus on his baptism, God said, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus knew his name. He was beloved by God. And we too are the beloved. We are a bride of Jesus Christ. We are children of God the Father. And do you experience, I want to ask you, do you experience his love as the love of a compassionate and merciful father, a husband who deeply loves you and desires the best for you? And where do you put your hope? Do you put it in Christ or do you put it in the things of the world? Do you put it in money and possessions or do you put it deeply in God, really wanting to know and understand his love and mercy that he has for you and live out of that, which is the best life ever to live? Are you distinct and different from those who don't know Christ? Jesus lived out of his identity, always spending time with his father. And if we are living in Christ, we need to have that relationship and live with him always. And our attitudes and our actions will come out of who we believe we are. And that's so important to know 
the truth of who we truly are in Christ. And so I ask you, how are you living? Are you distinct and different and living holy lives to Christ? Or are you in any way living in exile to the loving God who has the greatest mercy and love and compassion for you? You are God's people. You are chosen and you are loved. And he has such mercy and love and compassion over you. And I pray that as you spend time with him and talk with him and listen to him, you will even more know how much the great love he has for you. Amen.